I'll interject um, when I feel it's necessary to um, expand a little bit on the topic that we're going to be covering. Um, but again, we, we probably have like I think 60 plus slides that we're going to cover. So again, I'm going to kind of go through it briefly. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to stop me and we'll just uh, discuss it a little bit more. Uh, but before we continue, this is actually a big chunk of, uh, of um, this particular course, this communication. Communication is of utmost importance, especially in a healthcare environment, um, because again, we're dealing with people and we're dealing with people's lives. And if you don't communicate, uh, if you don't communicate properly, that could be the difference between life and death or even a lawsuit. So it's a matter of communication, trying to get us from A to B to C to D, okay? Uh, so we're gonna spend a little bit of time on that today. Now, but before we continue, um, understanding human nature and people in general is what's gonna make us better communicators in our field. Um, if you guys are familiar with Maslow, Maslow was this uh, gentleman over here that developed this pyramid of the needs of man. And it's very simple, very basic, but it has very strong implications in what we do in our world. So in the very bottom are your basic needs. Your basic needs are your physiological needs, which is <coughs> breathing, eating, sleeping, sex, uh, homeostasis, and also excretion. But these are our basic needs as human beings. This is what we need to survive. Anything above that is just, you know, your, your layers <coughs> is what makes you even more, uh, more whole as a human being. With our objective, reaching self-actualization. Now, this pyramid exists, and some of us may stop somewhere here, <coughs> maybe here, and not very of us ever reach self-actualization, but that's all what we're striving for uh, to do. The next one here is safety. So after your physiological needs, you have safety, which is your security of body, making sure that you have a job, uh, of uh, resources, of morality, of family, of health, and also property. And again, as we move up, this pyramid becomes more and more complex. The next one here is the sense of, uh, of love and the sense of belonging, having friendships, uh, having a secure family, and also sexual intimacy. Uh, again, it may stop right here, but this is where you guys are at this particular level here is esteem. When you're working on self-esteem, a lot, you know, it's, it's your appearance, uh, maybe it stops at appearance, but then it may be um, doing voluntary work, whatever it is that makes you feel like you're contributing. Now, in this particular area here of esteem, we're also talking about achievement. This is why you guys are in college. This is what's going to make you guys feel like, a, uh, like this, this whole person. Getting an education, getting a job, providing for your, your loved ones, your family, so you can achieve more goals. And then self-actualization, okay, self-actualization. This is where there's a lot of critical thinking, problem solving that is involved. This is where morality, creativity comes into play, spontaneity. But most important here is the lack of prejudice and the acceptance of facts. Acceptance of facts. So this is self-actualization. So once you've reached this, then you've completed this Maslow's hierarchy needs of man. An understanding of this will <coughs> help you become a better communicator in your field of study. All right. Communication with patients and their families. We're going to be talking about the different ways of communicating. First, we'll focus on verbal communication. There are six components in communication. You have a beginning, you have a middle, and you have an end. The beginning here is the message. The message is what the communicator hopes to convey to the receiver. How is that message going to be delivered? That would be um, B and C. Okay. Who's going to deliver it? How is it going to be delivered? 
through verbiage, through writing, through some sort of multimedia, okay? But there are many sources that are available out there to deliver this message. Then you have the receiver, the individual at the other end. What is the context, the set of circumstances that surround this communication? Now, lastly, and this is going to be the most important part of the cycle because it is cyclical. It's a cycle. This is going to be the most important part here is feedback. Feedback is the response which you get from the receiver and making sure that whoever delivered the message did it accordingly and appropriately. Feedback will tell you whether or not you communicated what you needed to do. And if you don't get that, uh, the uh, acceptable feedback, then you recommunicate that message again until you get the feedback that you want. It's a cycle. Okay? And this is what we use as a tool as clinicians. Because if the patient is not following our directions adequately, Again, this is the difference between life and death. They also got to be able to communicate with you. Remember when you bring a patient into the room, taking a patient's history. Well, first of all, making sure that you got the right patient. That's all part of communication, right? Make sure that you got the right patient. Making sure that you are doing the correct procedure. Making sure that the patient is educated so that they understand that the procedure, the type of procedure that they are going to be receiving and what to expect of that procedure. If there is a breakdown in this communication, again, that's going to be very problematic. Okay, so this is where feedback comes in. So when speaking, you've got to use clear, concise language when speaking to patients. Don't speak too quickly, enunciate, Avoid having long pauses. Okay? Don't talk down to patients or treat them impersonally. We don't refer to our patients as a room number. ER bed nine. The gallbladder in, in surgery. Okay? Baby number two in ICU. Okay? Those are the things that you <coughs> avoid. We want to make it personable, but not as an item or an object. Treat patients as individuals. It will alleviate fear and anxiety. Don't assume the patient knows what you are doing. Explain the procedure and ask if they followed written prep instructions. You answer the questions to the best of your ability. As I said in the past, you know, education, part of the education that you're going to be delivering to these patients, they will also have some questions to ask you. <coughs> And I warned you before, if they ask you a question, it may be an answer that they already know. <coughs> so they may be testing your expertise. Use powers of observation. So it's not just speech. There's body language. There's facial expressions. Okay? Those are also important factors in communication. It's not all about speech, guys. Which brings me to this slide. <coughs> Communication, face-to-face -face communication, the way you convey your message. When you look at this pie chart, very basic. But look at this. Only 10% of what you say is conveyed in the message that you're trying to deliver. 10% of it is, is words. Okay. 50% of it is going to be body language. Have you guys ever heard that phrase, action speaks louder than words? Action speaks louder than words. It doesn't matter what you say. It's how you act out. Here's another expression. Here's, here's tone of voice, 40%. Tone of voice. Have you ever heard somebody say to you, or have you heard somebody <coughs> say, it's not what you said? It's how you said it. Look at this, 90%. 90% of that is conveyed in the message. Only 10% of it is words. 
So if you guys can remember this, you guys can become very effective communicators. Make a copy of this slide, put it in your pocket. I carry one with me all the time. I'm just kidding. But this is effective. But I always refer to this, because every time I'm communicating, I refer to this pie chart, it's in my head. Okay, <coughs> attitudes. Attitudes are a set of beliefs that a person holds towards issues or persons that cause him or her to respond in a predetermined manner. In this particular slide, what it's talking about here is how you perceive things. The way we perceive things is going to be different from one individual to the next. Because we all have been raised, I mean, we have basic foundations that are very common from individual to individual. But they vary by the people that you are around with and those other influences. It could be your mom, your dad, your cousins, your siblings, your pastor, okay? Movies that you watch, foods that you eat. These are things that influence how you behave or act towards certain things, okay? This is part of your environment. And again, if you look at the slide, it says here no two people will have the same view, views about things, okay? So these are what our attitudes are. And if you also understand this, this will make you a better communicator. <clears throat> All right, so going back to voice, tone, and volume. When we're talking about <coughs> communication in this category, <coughs> we're talking about paralanguage. <coughs> paralanguage has to do with the sound of speech rather than the content itself. Okay, so rather than the content. Use correct pauses and inflections. You want to use correct grammar. When you're speaking, when someone, and this is, this is me, I don't know about you guys, but when I'm listening to somebody talk and they use the wrong grammar, sometimes I'm so focused on that particular thing than the context of what they're trying to say. It happens to me all the time with my teenage boy, because he's always using you know, slang and things like that. And so he's trying to tell me what happened at school or with his friends, and he's using the slang. I'm so focused on what the one word that he said, I'm like, hold on a second. And I'm trying to urban dictionary it, okay? And then lose in that whole context, I've already forgotten what he was trying to tell me. Understand the material you want to communicate so you can transmit it to the patient. If the patient has difficulty hearing, speak in a normal tone of voice, but speak closer to the patient's good ears. We've talked about speaking in front of the patient. Okay, A lot of them may be lip readers, some of them may be hard of hearing, so you speak in front of them, <coughs> not to the side, not behind them. All right. If there is a speech or language barrier, you may also have to use Okay? Not speech, but you may have to use hand gestures. You may have to use drawings. You may have to act it out. There are other ways to communicate with your patient on what you're going to be doing. Okay? But it has to be effective. It has to be effective. That is the key here. If you're going to use other resources, it has to be effective in making sure that you are conveying the message that you want the receiver to understand. Here's another key important point. They don't listen well if in pain. If you are in pain, I'm not focused on what you're trying to tell me. I'm focused on trying to control my pain. If they are accompanied with another person, make sure that that other person also can hear or communicate well with you. Tone of voice expresses emotion and a variety of feelings, including enthusiasm, disgust, concern, or indifferences. Okay, here's another chart, paralanguage. This is broken up into four different sections. We're not talking about what is being said, it's about how you say it. Not only how you say it, but how you're acting, right? So 
Here's an example, warmth shown by an open posture. Okay? Sympathetic gestures, careful use of personal space, <clears throat> a relaxed, warm tone of voice, smiles, crinkled eyes, expansive gestures, but you're open, as opposed to someone who may be showing some hostility. Okay? Just by the way they are behaving in front of you, body language facial expressions. So you have an aggressive posture, harsh tone of voice, maybe a set mouth, a frown, distance or staring eyes. You know, some of you have used this, you just don't realize it. Okay? As kids growing up, and I didn't know this then, but I was using this chart, okay? But growing up, I knew when I can approach my parents and let them know that I wrecked the car by just how they were acting. You guys knew when to approach certain people when you can when you can communicate what you're trying to in a better environment, right? You know when people were approachable and not approachable just by these things alone. Okay? So also, you know, when you get a chance, look at this. Very, very, again, very informative. Okay? Because when you communicate with your patients, again, it's not just speech. You can get a lot by, by simply watching your patients' actions and how they respond to some of your questions. Effective listening includes maintaining eye contact, which shows just frank and willingness to listen. <clears throat> Respond to questions with language they can understand. We'll talk about this later on. When communicating with patients, we deal with a large patient population and it's very diverse. We talk about the young to the old, different backgrounds, different cultures, different religions, uh, different genders. How we act and how we talk uh, you know, to one individual is going to be different from another individual. We are constantly shifting gears. Don't ever fall, don't ever fall in the trap <coughs> that all people are gonna be treated the same way. That doesn't work that way. We are, again, we are very diverse, so you constantly have to shift gears. Once you can master that, you're also going to be a master communicator, okay? Watch the way patients react to your message to see if you are being understood. Leaning forward shows you are interested and focused on the conversation. It's two ways. <clears throat> so not only are you observing them, but they may be observing you too. Nonverbal communication methods. Talks about things you see, hear, feel, and smell. We've talked already about facial expressions and how they can convey a message without words being said. Physical appearance, how you look, <laughs> plays an important part in communication. The patient will place confidence on a radiographer if you look like a professional. Okay, if you look like a professional, well, what do you mean by looking like a professional? Okay, so growing up. Okay. If you had known me 30, 35 years ago, I'm not the same person back then as I am today. Okay. Did a lot of growing up, I did a lot of changing. One of those things that I did starting maybe 25 years ago is I started <coughs> shaving my head. Okay. I started shaving my head. It's not as it is like today. Today is acceptable. Back then when you shaved your head, they usually tied you in with a certain group. Are you guys with me so far? Okay. They usually tied you in with a certain group. I also dress, I, I like to dress in jeans and t-shirts. So, growing up, I got mistook for being a gang member. Which meant that when I went to nice restaurants, I always got sat in the back. Not in the front, where the public could see me. When I went to Nordstrom's, you guys go to Nordstrom's, right? You've got, you got the, the, uh, the workers that are approaching you every time. 
because they work on commission, so they want your business, right? You know how many times I went to Nordstrom's in my, uh, my jeans and my t-shirt and my <coughs> baseball cap, and they just walked right by me? Do you know how that feels? But it's based on appearance. That's how we are as human beings. We judge people by the way they look. Yes or no? Yes, right? Now, again, let's go back to the, to the shopping center. Okay? Women, how many times have you gone through the mall, you see someone who looks real, really well dressed, they're showing their nice figure, nice makeup, done up hair, and the first thing you say is, look at that skank. Yes or no? Do you do, do you or do you not do that? Guys do the same thing. We make judgment on the way people look. Okay? Now, how do you look professional? Okay? Your patients are going to judge you by your appearance. Okay? Your appearance and your smell and the way you talk. All right? So, Nicely pressed, nicely pressed scrubs. Okay? No wrinkles, not just out of the wash. Good hygiene. We talked about good hygiene, not because of aseptic environment, but if you don't smell good. I'm talking about body odor, even your mouth, if you have bad breath. Your patients are going to step back. Okay? They are going to judge your performance based on the way you look. So if you, um, again, if you are well-groomed, it engenders trust, clean clothes, shoes polished, clean hair, hair pinned up, <coughs> da 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 da, okay? But they're gonna say here, oh, okay, well, they're nicely dressed, so I'm probably gonna get good service. Now we all know that's not always true, right? How many times have you gone to a restaurant Okay, that looks really good on the outside. You go in and you get lousy service or you get lousy food. The best places I've gone are hole in the walls. People that, I, I mean, places that I would just not even give a second look to, I'll just keep on driving. But one day you say, you know what, I pass it every day, go on the way to work. You think, I think I'm going to stop by and check it out. Best service, best food. Okay? But that's how we are as humans. We judge by appearances, okay? So if you are sloppy, they will think you have sloppy work habits. <laughs> Clean and neat environment. So not only you, but also the environment that you, that you work in. We are a, rep a representative of the hospital, of the school, okay? We are in public relations. So how we look will convey the type of work that we're also trying to convey. Okay. Sad but true. Everybody agree? Mm -hmm. All right, let's talk about touch. Firm and gentle touch is positive. Yes, this is a great way to alleviate some stress and some anxiety in, in, in patients. Okay? But you also got to understand when it's appropriate to touch. I know, because I've been working in the field for many years, I know the proper place to put my hands to help some uh, release some of that anxiety. On the shoulder, <clears throat> okay? On the shoulder, on the top of their back, on their knee, okay? <clears throat> You don't put your hand on the patient's thighs. <laughs> you don't put it on the small or of their back. You don't put it on their hip. You guys are with me so far, right? <laughs> and even then, there are certain cultures, okay, certain cultures where touching is just inappropriate altogether, okay? You've got to be able to make that shift, guys. It doesn't apply to all patients. Okay, so you gotta be able to recognize that. Okay, so metacommunication. Metacommunication is nonverbal communication. Nonverbal communication, as opposed to here a prepare language which relates to sound of speech, not content. Okay? Sound of speech, not content. This is talking about nonverbal. This includes pantomiming. Are you guys familiar with that term, pantomiming? That's that guy right there. 
Okay, pantomime, acting it out. Okay? Facial expressions, posture, physical appearance and touch, or even personal space. Again, this is all nonverbal ways of communications. People become very uncomfortable when strangers move into this space. All right? But as clinicians, we have to work within that space. <coughs> what we do is very personable. Okay? So we need to understand these different distances. Social distance is between 4 to 12 feet. Working and not sharing personal thought or feelings. This is how it is with the, the clerks in the front desk. Okay, it's very social. So the patient comes in, they check in with the prescription to get the procedure done. This is gonna be your social, dis social distance. Now, as us, as clinicians, we have now what is known as personal distance. We go to the waiting room, we go to the ER to get our patient, okay? It's gonna be 18 inches to four feet. This is what we use when we initiate conversation <coughs> with our patients. We get them out of the waiting room, and now we are gonna stand a little bit closer. I'm gonna start getting their history. Well, first I'm gonna introduce myself, okay? I'm gonna introduce myself, then I will start getting the patient's history. Why are you here? Why are we doing this? So on and so forth, okay? Now when we start the actual procedure, <coughs> this is the intimate distance, okay? We gotta move in, guys, because we have to touch to, to do and perform the procedures that we are about to do. 18 inches or less, 18 inches or less, okay? And it can even be more personable than this or less part, right? Because we may be doing some probing. We might be having to do some needle sticks, some insertions of enemas, different probes, internal probes, okay? But as you're doing this, you're communicating with your patient, letting them know what you're going to do and what they should expect. No surprises, okay? Because once there is a breakdown in that communication, you guys remember battery and assault, false imprisonment, all those different things? Okay, this, that's what can happen when you don't use effective communication. All right. So ask permission before touching and encourage them to tell you of any discomfort. <coughs> we talked about body language. Make sure your body language agrees with, with what you are saying. Body language can contradict the spoken word. Okay? When you are speaking, you can ac accent what, uh, what you're saying with different types of body, body language. An example they were saying here is when you're saying no and slamming your fist on the table when you're saying no. That's just an example. Okay, receiver nodding and listening or looking away and seeming disinterested. So, <laughs> this is actually funny, okay? Because it happens all the time as a clinician. But it also happens in a regular environment. You're talking, you're speaking, and you continue to speak, and the person at the other end is doing this. And you continue to speak, and they're just doing this. All right, Miss Jones, uh, do you understand everything that we're doing? What did you say? Yeah, I said, okay, so now can you repeat what I just said? <laughs> okay. So when they are nodding, when they are totally agreeing with what you're saying, that's usually a red flag. Okay? So when that happens, stop. <clears throat> Ask them to repeat what you just said, and if they don't understand, you're probably going to have to slow down a bit and rephrase. Now, I'm going to say this over and over again, rephrase. If the receiver does not understand what you are trying to convey, you don't say the same thing again, because if they didn't understand you the first time, 
Repeating it is not going to get them to understand. You're going to have to rephrase your statement, rephrase your message <coughs> until they get it. Okay? So do not restate, you rephrase. There's a huge difference. Okay? Any questions? Eye contact. Again, we're talking about communication, guys, okay? Eye contact. When you are communicating, maintain good eye contact. When you have good eye contact, it shows respect and willingness to listen, right? A lack of eye contact signals distrust, anxiety, or a lack of confidence in general, okay? But again, it depends on your culture and your background. To have eye contact can mean the opposite. Having eye contact can also mean being disrespectful. 